So, the first Italian, so to speak, to set foot in the new continent was Christopher Columbus, if he was Italian, in 1492. After him, there were other navigators, other explorers, uh, and I think in the 1600s, when New York was called New Amsterdam, the very first recorded Italian who arrived and became a permanent inhabitant of America was Cesare Alberti, who changed his name to Caesar Alberti. After him, a trickle of individuals came, and at the very beginning, most of them were rather high-skilled workers, stone cutters who, for instance, worked on the White House and the Capitol, painters, uh, all people who had a trade, tradesmen of uh, a variety, from a variety of fields. But that was a very negligible, from a numerical standpoint, a very negligible migration. At the time, we are talking about 1600s, 1700s, the very large wave of migration came first from England in the 1700s and early 1800s from Germany, and there there were already some problems. For instance, Benjamin Franklin um, with his several newspapers and publications, was uh, very wary of uh, Germans and uh, recommended that they would be not allowed to speak German language. Uh, uh, he was advocating a number of restrictions on their on their freedoms, in fear that they may not integrate and that rather they would steer the boat in a different direction. So as you see, the fears that the foreigners may change the nature of this nation has always been there from the very beginning. Today, it's the Muslims, right? People are fanatically uh, paranoid about Muslims uh, imposing Sharia law. You know, a million and a half Muslims would be able to change the constitution by themselves. Anyways, this sort of paranoia always existed. After the Germans, generally speaking, the very first chunk of immigration that caused serious political trouble were the southern Germans, Germans from southern Germany, from Bavaria in particular. What was the difference? That these people, Bavarians, were Catholic somehow in addition to the language difference, the culture difference, uh, there was also this element which at the time had an enormous, enormous relevance. So here comes, here come the uh, Catholic Germans. The next wave that was recorded and which really marked uh, in a way the moment when migration starts occurring in mass proportions by entire ethnic groups was the migration of Irish. In the late 1840s through the early 1950s, Ireland suffered a devastating, a devastating famine. It was called the potato blight. All of a sudden, literally, potatoes, which were the main crop for the population, this crop failed miserably. There was a rot or a, some kind of a fungus uh, or parasite that wiped out the entire harvest. In a matter of two, three years, one million Irish died. One million Irish migrated to the United States and one million was left in Ireland. So out of the population of 3 million initially, 2 million left the country, either dead or coming to the United States. There are other political implications of uh, the relationship with England and so forth, but that was the result. When the Irish came, no, they were not welcome because they were Catholic, because there were so many of them. 
and they were seen as very dangerous. And uh, in fact, there was a political movement, it was called the American Party, something like this, which engaged in systematic harassment and attempted to either block immigration or in some way or another limit the integration of Irish in every possible way. They became known as, uh, this party, the No Nothing. They had all sorts of terroristic activities going on against the Irish, you know, destroying stores, uh, attacking schools, uh, whatever you want. They called themselves the No Nothings because whenever they were interrogated by the police, their standard answer was, I know nothing. Or maybe, I don't know nothing. Um, that described you know, a very, very tough set of circumstances for the Irish. If you go to see um, local newspapers at the time, you can even do a search on uh, Google Images and you put in Irish immigration propaganda, anti-Irish immigration propaganda, you will see the depiction of Irish as apes, uh, the usual uh, armamentary, the usual stuff that you see uh, in political propaganda. Now, the Irish had one asset, one very important card to play, and it was the fact that they spoke English. So despite the fact that they came mostly dispossessed, and they didn't even have a penny um, in their pockets, that they were mostly peasants, but at least they were able to integrate rather um, freely and uh, speedily into society by virtue, of, by virtue of the fact that they spoke the language. Another large group that came later were the Eastern European Jews. Because of uh, internal uh, affairs of the Russian Empire, which at the time controlled all, went from Poland all the way to Siberia, uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, Lithuania, all those uh, little states, independent states, were under the control of the Russian Tsar. The Jews were given uh, the option of either die or leave. Those who were not killed in large massacres called pogroms were expelled and uh, in very large, significantly large groups came to America. Now, aside from issues of anti-Semitism and so forth, the Jews, when they came, they had a certain number of strikes against them. Well, they were not uh, Anglo-Saxon. No, they were not even Christian. But the great advantage they had was the fact that all males were literate. Because they are the people of the book, all males and a significant amount of women as well did know how to read and write. Not only, but they among themselves had a common language. Whether from Romania or from Lithuania, going from the Urals to Poland, and I'm going to put up an image here, they all spoke the common language called Yiddish. Yiddish is a hybrid of German and Hebrew. So among themselves, they spoke Yiddish. If you go to um, what are called ultra-Orthodox uh, areas in uh, Borough Park and other areas of Brooklyn, you will hear that they are speaking this funny language, so to speak, and in large part they're speaking still Yiddish. Uh, the language, the common language of European Jewry. And I'll interrupt here briefly. So the pogroms and the violent expulsion of uh, Jews from uh, Central Europe by the Russian power um, took place around um, 1860-1870, and then they continued uh, uh, throughout the 19th century, the 20th century. Uh, but in addition to, as I said, Jewish men being literate, 
The other characteristic of that migration was that the entire society moved away. So you had all layers, from the milkman to the peasant to the little accountant to the shopkeeper, all the way up to the rabbi. So the entire structure of the society, with its entirely function society, moved in blocks, literally, from wherever they were living to the United States. And that allowed them to function and to resume their activities uh, almost instantly. Reciprocal support, community, language community, and the ability to um, read and write, which made acquiring another language at a higher level uh, very easy. And therefore, in penetrating higher positions and higher professions. Then come the Italians, around the 1880s. The Italians had none of those assets. They did not speak English, not only, but they did not even speak Italian. And that is one of the uh, most misunderstood or harder to understand um, aspects of Italian culture. Italy, for the longest time, people of Italy had two languages. One is Italian, which is the formal language that is written and starts back from the 1300. To this very day, an educated Italian can read texts written in the 1300s and by Dante or people like that. This is not possible for British French, Portuguese, uh, German, whatever. So it's a very stable language, a literary language. And it was, it was used as the so-called lingua franca, which is the common language that everybody uses when they come from different uh, linguistic backgrounds. So English today is the lingua franca of the world. It's the lingua franca of business, it's the lingua franca of technology. Or even tourism, you know, if you want to go anywhere and you know some English, you pretty much you can be assured that you can get by with it because locals will know some English. Now, that was Italian back then. The very low class, the peasants, the dispossessed, the poorest of the poor, did not know Italian. What did they speak? They spoke the local dialects. Now, dialect does not simply mean a different pronunciation or an intonation. When we say dialect in America, we talk about slight differences in pronunciation. For instance, Boston dialect versus Appalachian dialect. Uh, Nebraska versus Brooklyn dialect. But yet, the language is identical. The grammatical rules are identical. Here we are talking about completely different language. Sicilians speaking Sicilians are not understandable to anyone else. Yeah, fragments of the conversation, words here and there, but basically their language is local and it is a fully developed language. Sicily is the island close to the end of the boot of Italy. If you take Napolitans, Napolitans who speak their dialect do not understand Italian, period. That was in the past, obviously. Everybody now is educated and so forth. But talking about 150 years ago, people who had no education, not only did they lack the ability to communicate with the foreigners, they didn't even communicate among themselves. So from Naples to Sicily to Bari to northern Italy, they all had different dialects that made it impossible to create a community. Historically, they did not come from the same place. Southern Italy was dominated by the vice kingdom of uh, Spain for the longest time. The north was dominated by Austrians, French, Spanish, at the various periods, for long periods during the troubled history of Italy. So, these people came to where? uneducated, illiterate, they did not have the simplest skills. They were peasants, they were just brute labor, brute force. 
and in addition to that, they couldn't even communicate among one another. So they didn't have any assets to sell. And they found themselves in this situation, in this society, and they, fit, they, they filled the jobs that they could find. So the possible, the lowest possible jobs. And that's how they, have, they are represented. They are represented being shoeshine or hoodlums, criminals, uh, loafers, or at best they find jobs in construction as cannon fodder, so uh, replaceable parts. And in many cases, people who went south, they became replacement labor for the recently emancipated uh, slaves. They were hired in these plantations and they took over the jobs that legitimately African Americans abandoned as soon as they were emancipated and liberated.